I didn't know, like, yeah. Oh. More people didn't or couldn't come, uh, but uh, we are really happy to welcome um, programmer and composer and new media artist Mark uh, with like huge experience and huge charisma, <laughs> yeah. and uh, he will tell you more about himself and, and about his work. And just a few words uh, for the beginning, like this talk. Uh, and our invitation of Mark is part of uh, our first uh, series of uh, input platform, and um, we are trying to uh, like we are inviting uh, new media uh, artists focus on intersection of art and technology uh, to give artist talks here to make workshops and then some performances or exhibitions. So we are trying to offer like alternative education and trying to show them or trying to offer people uh, um, uh, possibility to meet them in person and to experience them as lecturers and, and artists and, and workshop leaders. And uh, tomorrow there is a workshop with Mark uh, where he's going to lead uh, participants for Isadora software, uh, uh, which he created. And then on Sunday uh, there is a performance of Mark and two dancers called Do It. And it's going to happen in Veltrichny Palace at uh, 10 oh, and 8 o'clock. So, uh, yeah. And uh, you can check out more information about us on LunchMeet websites or like input uh, when you type input to Facebook, then you can, you can find like different events uh, made by us. So, I'm really happy that you are here and that you are giving a speech anyway. Thank you. And I would, if you don't mind, it would be nice if you kind of came to the center so it doesn't, so I can just talk to you guys there. That would be great. Okay. So, um, first, thank you for the invitation to come. I appreciate that. And, um, I guess you sort of know, but I'll just say briefly, my name is Mark Coniglio. I am the co-founder of a dance company called Troika Ranch, which is kind of pretty much on hiatus now, but it was co-funded by myself and Don Stapiello, a choreographer. And we worked for 20 years, and we started our, our company a long time ago, and the focus was always on doing interactive performance with dance. That's kind of what our specialty was. And so, it was through that experience and my continuing work making uh, interactive artworks that that's where all this is coming from. And I, as long as I'm uh, mentioning it, um, I'll, uh, some of the ideas I'm going to talk about today really are Dawn's ideas too. We worked on this together very closely for many years, so it's a pity she's not here to join us. But anyway, she should be here in spirit because we shared the creation of this whole project and the lust. So my thinking builds on things that we made together. So, to, just to let you see how far back it goes, let's take a look. Probably some of you weren't even born, right? Um, here's me. That's the, my last year at California Institute of the Arts where I invented a device called MIDI Dancer. This was a system to measure the movements of the dance, the flexion of the dancer's bodies. And that was being sent on a radio transmitter to my incredible 512K Mac Plus only on floppy drives where they were able to make music with that. So considering how long ago it was, it was pretty breakthrough stuff, uh, you know. So that's what I was doing already uh, in my last year there. But I want to go back even further, before, before this even, to when I was a freshman in high school. You definitely weren't born then, in 1974. And so I was learning how to program computers. I was already interested in music, but I also am a computer programmer, and I taught myself how to do it. And there was this teacher who gave me a really interesting problem, because he saw how good I was getting at it. He said, you should make a program that learns. And I said, well, I don't have any idea how to do that. And he said, well, let me give you an example and explain this game, which I want to explain to you. It's called NIM. It's an ancient Chinese game. It's very simple. You make three groups of objects, and, and you can put really as many objects in each pile as you like, but in this example we have seven, five, and three. And when you play the game, whoever clears the board so that there's no pieces left, that's the winner. 
Yeah? So we're going to play, even though you're not really going to play, because I'm going to play for you. So I'm going to take the first move, and I'm going to remove those three. Because the rules are you can remove as many objects from one pile as you like, but not from the whole thing. So only from one row in this case. So I took those three, and you respond by taking the two on the end there. And so then I say, OK, I'm taking the entire bottom row. And you say, OK, I'm going to take those three. And now I realize I'm in trouble because no matter what I do, you're going to win. Right? So admitting my defeat, I take away those two. And you take the last piece, and you win. I, I find that when you're giving talks, it's always good to let the audience win because it gets them on my side already. All right? But there's some properties about this, this uh, system. Because what I did was, I then set out to make a computer program where the, I would uh, compete with the computer in playing the game NIM, and it would learn how to play and get better at it. Yeah? Hi. So, hello. <clears throat> We're, uh, just for context, we're, we're, we're in 1974 when I'm a freshman in high school. I'm describing a program I wrote that was to allow a computer how to learn. Amazing. Okay. <laughs> so it's a long time ago. So the basic idea is if you look at the game, there are always the, the, the way the board is right now and the next board after someone makes a move. There's all these combinations. When you look at all the combinations, there's about 60,000 different combinations. So what I did to make this program was I made a table that had every possible pairing of before and after a move, right? So there's 60,000 items in the table. And at the beginning, they all have a zero. Every slot in the table has a zero in it, yeah? And then what happens is I play the computer. And of course, at the beginning, because it doesn't have any information, I win every time. So what it does is, it looks at the moves the, the winner took, and in the table, it makes it go plus one. And then it takes the loser's move, and it makes it go minus one. So now in the table, all the moves I made have a plus one, and all the moves the computer made have a minus one. Yeah? And so, the way it works is when you, you know, as it plays, as it starts to get numbers in the table, the computer always chooses the row that has the, when it sees a move, it says, oh, this has the highest number, I'm going to choose this move, right? So the longer you play, the better the computer gets until, and that was the magic moment for me, and it's probably why I'm standing here in front of you. I started playing it at 6 p.m., and at 2 a.m., something happened because I couldn't beat it anymore. Somehow, I had created this piece of software that accumulated knowledge, and I couldn't beat it. And I couldn't believe what I had just done. I was freaking out, and I was only by myself at 2 o'clock in the morning in the computer room in my high school doing this. But, you know, that was a very powerful moment for me to think that I could create something that had this kind of in seemingly intelligence. Yeah? Now, there's some properties here that are important for what we're talking about with interactivity today, and I want to talk about those. The system is self-organizing. It, it, it starts with no knowledge, but it accumulates knowledge over time, and it improves, much like a lot of the AI stuff that we see around us today. Very simple rules yield complex results. Now, the rule is very simple. Pick the highest move in the table, with the, or the move with the highest number, right? Very simple. But believe me, when the computer beats you at a game like this, it seems very complicated or very complex because the fact that a computer could you know, beat a human being, it gives you that feeling of complexity. And the key here is that feedback drives the, the evolution of the system. The winning moves are successful. It's just like any evolutionary system. The ones that do better survive, and the ones that do worse, the minus ones, don't survive. And this is exactly the same. So it's an evolutionary system in that regard. And there's agency. The behavior of the player, and in this case the human player, drives the organization of the system. Something really interesting happened. So I kept playing for another hour. I kept losing for an hour because I couldn't beat it. So now it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and I decided, OK, I'm going to play it to lose on purpose. And I did, and I lost on purpose. And I did that for maybe another hour. And then I started playing to win again, and now I could beat it sometimes. 
because the assumption of the system was that the human player would always play to win. And so I polluted the data by playing to lose, and I never got it to, I never got it to be perfect again until I erased all the data and I started over. So that's sort of interesting uh, anecdote that goes along with this. Okay, so that's NIM, and that's 1989. So, so, sorry, 1974. Now we jump forward 20 years, and we skip over the thing, because what I did is, after I made this device called MIDI Dancer, this very simple, by the way, I made it out of, uh, I went to a hobby shop and I bought radio control cars and I pulled the transmitters and all the bits out of the cars and I turned it into this system that measured the movement of the dancers. It was very uh, flaky, it worked, but it was, you know, it was a little bit unreliable. But I continued to work on this idea because I really was interested. I, I had gone to CalArts. I, by the way, I came from a small place in the Midwest in the United States. I had never seen contemporary dance before I went to this school. I didn't know it existed. And I fell in love with it, and I really said that when I was studying music there, I just, I want to write music for this. And that's where I met Dawn, and we started our long collaboration. So we worked with this device for a long time, and I kept developing it. But in this year, we premiered a piece that was kind of the piece that put us on the map, or that people started paying attention to us, because it was a great combination, I think, of, of doing this kind of interactive performance, and, and also a piece that had artistic value, I hope. Yeah, so I want to show you a little bit of that. Um, I'm going to show you an opening section, and then I'll show you a later section. But so, and by the way, here's Don Stapiello, the co-founder with me of Troika Ranch. <laughs> To go back and explain what we were doing there because I think the method, the way in which we were doing it is actually kind of important. But I should explain that the MIDI dancer in this, by this time was much more sophisticated and we had eight sensors on the body, one on each wrist, one at each elbow, one at the two, at the, I mean one at each hip, and one at each knee. So there was a total of eight sensors there that we were measuring with. So what I want to do is I want to play it again and I want to explain a little, a little bit about what was happening. Because um, one of the techniques that I think is important is uh, we did, we're doing something that I think really came out of my studies with my, my teacher and mentor, Morton Sabotnik, the composer, um, this notion of score following. So if I start this over, uh, except the sound is off. Hold on. Do this again. Sound, sound, sound. Oh, of course, I can't get at you. All right, so here we go. We'll try it again. And... Okay. Okay, first of all, it's following along and it's triggering this music and then she goes like this, right? What the computer is at that moment doing, it has an instruction saying, as soon as you see both elbows bend and both knees bend, and then you see all four of them straighten again, go on to the next section. So this is important because a lot of what you typically see is people controlling stuff where it's like a direct connection between their movement and what's going on. Here we were also using it to move through a score. To have, we had a kind of set up piece. And part of our idea was we were quite macho about it then. We wanted, you know, Dawn, it's like I didn't touch the computer at all during the performance. It was completely up to Dawn how this thing was done. So she knew that she could stand there for as long as she wanted until she did that action and it was going to go on, right? And I have to, you have to put this a little bit in context. To you guys who pick up your iPhone all the time, that doesn't seem like anything. But in a time when the only way that we could play music was pretty much on CDs or even tape, the notion that the music and the, the score could be directly controlled by the performer, 
that was a big shift and an important shift in what people were thinking about. So that was kind of like, I think, we weren't the only one doing that, by the way. There were several, many of us at that time. But again, it's very early. The internet didn't even exist or it barely existed in 1994, right? So it's a long time ago. So, because the point is, some nights she held it for a moment, and other nights she held it for five or six seconds or more. And that opportunity, because Dawn is a fantastic dancer, and she understands what it means to be in front of an audience, and it means to hold the pose and feel that tension between her and the audience, and then to make that next dramatic move. To give that option to the performer, as opposed to making uh, the performer follow the music, that was the important part to us. So let's continue. So she's about to do those moves. Bend straight. And so three, two things happen. One, you hear the sound that you just heard. This gets triggered. And then a video is also triggered. You also have to remember, again, this is like, you know, when your grandfather tells you that, you know, he had to walk both ways uphill to go to school and all like that, you know, or walk 10 miles in the snow to go to school. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like that right now. <coughs> but, but in fact, you know, you could even play video on a computer back then. This was a laser disc player that I made a box that allowed me to send MIDI commands to it so I could do random access video because you couldn't actually do that on a computer yet, not with full, full resolution video. So it plays the sound and it plays the uh, clip and then it's gonna wait for her to bend her elbows and you're gonna hear a new sound and then she's gonna stand up and it's gonna go into a new section. So, uh, sorry, straighten her elbows. Or no, bend. And then now you hear it change, right? Now it's in a very different mode because what it is is it's an eight point counterpoint of machine sound. So I wrote like a counterpoint percussion piece, if you will, for machines. And she's remixing it because basically each limb is a volume control for those eight individual tracks. So, be, so while I composed that to be heard in whole, she recomposed it every night by the way in which she flexed her, her uh, limbs around, right? And the other thing that she can do is if she moves quickly, like you'll see at the very end, she can add an accent. So the tracks are going along, she's remixing it. Okay, a little accent at the end, right? Okay, I'm, I'm going to go on from there, and I, I don't want to spend too much more time on this, but it's just interesting. Part of the reason that exists is that it's the beginning of the piece. It's, it's how we kind of like lead us into the idea, but it also had to exist in those days because people simply didn't get that it was possible that a dancer could do this. In the review, in the, in the review of this in the Los Angeles Times, it said, intriguing live versus tape duets, right? So they thought it was a tape a videotape, because even though it said quite clearly in the program that it wasn't. Anyway, let's take a look at how it goes on from there. Okay, so 
I mean, there's a lot going on there, and I'm not going to tear that apart for you like I did in the first part, but suffice to say that, you know, she's controlling a lot. There's some things that are actually, that at a certain point, there's kind of an ostinato, we would say, in music, a thing that's going on by itself, so she doesn't have to produce every sound that's there. And, and you can see clearly that there's a relationship between her and the video image of herself. In those days, again, the internet was just coming about. I had met someone that had, a, for the first time around that same time, I met someone who had a, an online avatar or a long, online presence. He, uh, he presented to the world as a man, but on, online he was a woman. And that it fascinated me, the idea that we could become someone else through the technology that was emerging in this way. And so the idea about identity and who is this person and what, is the, what does the technological version of Dawn, the one that lives in the video image, what capabilities do they have and how do they, how, how do they work against or for each other? That was really the question of the piece. So in that sense, part of the thing I think people were reacting to in terms of the notice that we got, we were also dealing with a, a question that was quite contemporary in that moment. I think we're way beyond that by now, but that was a question that was really a big question at that time, yeah? Okay, so we go on to make a whole bunch more of this work, and I'm not gonna survey that for you now because I need to get to the part I really need to talk to you about. But I want to show you a piece that I think is, I think is the best piece of this over or this genre of dance and interactive media works, and we didn't make it. It's called Glow. It was created by a choreographer from Australia called Gideon Obazna for his group Chunky Move, and the video was made by my friend and uh, co-Berlin resident, um, Frieder Weiss. Um, so let me just briefly show you that, because I think this is the epitome of where this work gets to. Do anybody know this piece? No? Okay. So that's 2006 or something like that. Well, maybe, yeah, somewhere around there, maybe 2008. So the thing is, is that they do a lot of things that really work in this piece. First of all, there is no, it's clear that this dancer is making this image happen. You cannot, it's so clear because they do something that no one up until then that I know about thought to do. They put the dancer on the floor. There's always been a problem of putting dancers up in front of a video behind them. I think, you know, we dealt with it in our own way in plain because the figure of Dawn and the figure of the, of the virtual Dawn and the real Dawn were essentially the same size, so it really was just a dance duet. There really wasn't a problem, but there were many pieces I saw with giant interesting video images and you forgot that the dancers were even there because they, they were just, they were enveloped by this image. So by putting her on the floor, because the thing that you don't see in this clip, sometimes she stands up. And when you're watching the piece, I was lucky to see it live, your eye goes like this, you don't see the video anymore, you see her. And they were very clever in taking our eyes where they wanted us to put them, either on the dancer or on the image, by where, whether she was standing or on the floor. Yeah? Um, but it's a really beautiful piece, but it's also, again, it's a piece that has a lot of, I think, uh, a, deep, a deeper meaning. You see at the very end, she's on the floor and there's this, almost this like black smoke or black clouds coming out of her. There's one point in, in this where she stands and she just 
lets out this growl, I don't know how else to describe it, a very deep and kind of angry sound. And it's right after that that all of this black stuff starts coming out of her on the floor. There was something really deep going on in the story of this piece. I can't tell you exactly what it, what it is, what that story is, but the, the dramaturgy of these images supported whatever was going on with this human being we had in front of it. That's another reason it's a very good piece, yeah? So that's a real highlight or a, a, an important moment because also I would say shortly thereafter, maybe mm, four or five years after that, you stop seeing work like this being made, which is kind of interesting because this field is not nearly as big as it was back when we were doing it, yeah? All right, but this defines something that I want to give a name to, this kind of work. So, oh, yeah, we'll skip this. That's a nice quote, but I'm going to, uh, that's, a, I, I will say this much. That's a quote from Brecht. I won't read you the whole thing right now. I can show you later if you want. But one thing I really like about it is that he goes into the thing, he's railing against Wagner, saying just Wagner is terrible for lots of different reasons. See, he said, uh, he, he talks about, he says, witchcraft of this sort must be avoided. He calls it witchcraft, having a big opera like this. But at a certain point, he says something I find very important for this kind of media work. He says, he says um, that, that it, he kind of indicates that to, to be able to appreciate it, you have to earn it. You have to go through something. It's not about spectacle. He was criticizing the spectacle of Wagner. And that earning of what you get to see he said, what you can't have is the unworthy ecstasy. That's something that I see a lot of the pieces, people send me stuff that they see on the internet, they see, because they know my work, they say, oh, you'll be interested in this. And I see it, and the dancing is kind of poor. I don't see very good dramaturgy, but I see some really fantastic imagery. That, for me, is the unworthy ecstasy. And I, that's kind of a side topic from this whole lecture. But it, it's important to me, because I feel like it's easy with technology to be spectacular but you still have to be an artist. You still have to be asking questions about what's going on in your world and what are you pissed off about or happy about and dealing with that, yeah? It's not just about making us go, wow, yeah? All right, so, but back to the topic that I'm trying to get to. I, the name for this kind of work, I call it the digital reflection. And here's the reason why. Because one way or another, everything that you're seeing on the stage or hearing or whatever it is, is a reflection of the body in front of you. So we have these sensors hooked up to the body and you move around and you hear a sound or you see something, it's, it's a kind of mirror. It's kind of like, you know, in, you know we have um, American carnivals, we have these fun house and you have the fun house mirror that's all, you know it, and you look really weird in it, but you know it's you. Right? And in a way, if these pieces are done well, especially like in GLOW, you know that the body is actually right there in front of you, also in the media. And so that's why I'm calling it a reflection. And if you want to map it out, like it, it kind of looks like this. There's, at the top is the performer. That's the source of all information. And then in the middle is the sensors and the computer. And I guess I should also say the creators, because in that middle part, you try and take that data and you turn it into something else because at the bottom, the, at the result, is the media, right? So performer moves, we deal with that information somehow and we get a, a visual, oral, maybe in a robotic object move, something like that, right? Now, if you look back, if you wanna go back and read some PhD stuff that people wrote about us and other people at that time, you'll see that several of us, including us, talked about this notion of a feedback loop because we were saying, well, of course, if you make this image, you're gonna take that in and it's gonna affect the way that you perform. You can even find a video of me saying exactly that somewhere on YouTube. And that basically was kind of bullshit because it really didn't happen. As much as we talked about it, no one was really dealing with taking that result and putting it back into the dancer's body. And, and so, more, so what you got in the end, in the, most of these digital reflections for this 20-year period, what you mostly saw was, in the best cases, really exquisite uh, digital scenography and, and, can, and sometimes very well done, like in GLOW and I, I feel like in some of the work we did. But what you didn't see was choreographers inventing new ways of moving 
because of the technology. And even though I'm not trained as a dancer, my training is as a composer and a self-trained computer programmer, I love dance and it's my, I go to way more dance concerts than I go to music concerts. It's the medium I love the most. And it was important for Don and I, I mean, we were interested in how do we move in different ways? How can technology do this? But if you look at the work, so for instance, a famous example is the piece by Merce Cunningham called, um, oh, I'm gonna blank on the name, that's terrible. I'll come back to that. But there's a famous piece we're using motion capture with Merce Cunningham, super famous choreographer, obviously. And did the choreography in that piece look any different than any other Merce Cunningham work? Absolutely not. It looked exactly like Merce Cunningham. Doesn't mean it wasn't a good piece. It was a good piece. I was lucky to see that one live in New York as well. But it didn't lead to a new way of moving. And so for me, who loves dance and is interested in how we can find new ways to move, that, having spent 20 years on that kind of stuff and that's not happening, that was a kind of disappointment for me and Dawn too, I would say. So, but then we did something different. We did something different in a piece that we made eight years ago already, so long ago, but it was really significant and it changed the way that I'm thinking about using technology. It, it, it directly informed and led to the creation of the short work that I will show on Sunday night, so it's good to talk about. And I wanna lead you through the process of how we made that piece, briefly. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a little part here. So if you look at this, it's a one-way system where information flows from the performer at the top to the media at the bottom. That's what I was talking about. The feedback loop, as much as we talked about it, it really wasn't there or you didn't see it very often. We also, one thing that's interesting, we typically adapt the technology to the needs of the performer. In other words, we try and make it comfortable. We try and make it you know, easy to wear and easy to use. We didn't try and change the way that she danced. We tried to make the technology accommodate the way that she danced, right? So it's really accommodating to the human being and that was my big question. Did it fundamentally change the way that we make or perform dances? And the answer was typically no. I won't rule out every possibility, but typically it was no. Okay, so now we leap forward again to 2009, which is when we premiered this piece. And this is what I want to explain in some depth. The piece was called Loop Diver. And we got really interested in the notion of looping. The reason, and that's obvious enough in a way, because the reason we love computers is because you can say, I need you to do this one billion times, and the computer says, I'm so happy to do that, that's fine. I would be happy to do that one billion times, right? That's why we love computers, so they repeat stuff, and they do it very accurately, right? So that was the idea, and so we wanted to see how we could put this on into, into the world of dance. Now, we actually took a long time to make this piece, and we did a lot of different attempts, and I could go on in deeper detail about that, but I'm gonna show you where we got to in the end because we had a lot of failures at the beginning with this idea uh, of how we were going about it. But I wanna show you where we got to. So here's a piece of a video of a piece, small piece of movement. They stand up, they lean back, and they turn. Here's the loop we know where the loops are the same as the same every time. So you're seeing the same little piece of material each repetition. And here's the same thing, but now it's going forward and backward. Okay, now I want to explain this. Imagine this is time, this is the video, this is the video that we have. Here's our first loop, it's just doing this on this little chunk here and you see the same thing. But what if after each time when we get to the end, we shifted that over a little bit. So we took the starting point and the ending point and we moved it, and then we play that, and then we moved it, and then we moved it. That's what you're about to see. Okay, so a little more of the material was revealed each time and then you lost the beginning. This is the same idea except the beginning is fixed and the ending point is now shifting later in time instead and the, and the starting point doesn't move. <laughs> so.
So we obviously we have these names here. I mean, I actually, as a musician, I identified that with a decrescendo. It's like somehow because the time was slowing down, it felt like the, seeing the, the thing on the music paper that goes like this, right? And you also, of course, have the opposite, a crescendo. Here's a more complicated one where it's actually shifting. It says growing, but it's getting, it's getting uh, shorter. So the beginning is moving this way and the ending is moving this way. They're moving towards each other. All right, so I made a tool in Isadora to allow me to do all the different variations of these kinds of loops. So I could take any digital material, a sound, a movie, and even, as you'll see in a minute, digital lighting information, and impose those kinds of loops on it. Because what we set out to do was, we decided that we were gonna make a piece using this technique. And um, so, again, after many trials, what, where we got to was, we tried a lot of dance movement. That was the first thing we did, and you know, Don had the dancers really dancing around and doing what dancers do. It didn't look interesting. That was one of the failures. In the end, what you're about to see is something very pedestrian, yeah? It was like walking, looking at people, embracing, shaking hands, kissing on the cheek. The, these were like day-to-day -day interactions. And we were a little bit inspired. I don't know if any of you know Giacometti's The Plaza. It's a sculpture where there are these five figures uh, on, a, on a kind of checkerboard surface, but you realize that they're never gonna meet. Actually, if you look at the path that they're taking, you realize these five figures will not ever meet. And that was a little bit of inspiration for this. So what we did in the end was, we made a five minute long piece of choreography and a five minute long piece of uh, music. I wrote the music and Don did this pedestrian choreography and we made a video of that. And then our job was to take that and put it into the tool and turn and loop it so that it started to look interesting. So what I want you to see is, I want you to see a bit of the uh, unedited video. So they're on the floor, they stand up, they walk to the center, they touch their faces in various ways. And then they're going to drop their hand, arms. And then they touch their faces again. Okay? That's 22 seconds of the five minutes. That's the first 22 seconds. Now what I'm going to show you is um, after, because then Don and I took that material, sat at my computer, and used this tool to start composing it. And it was a very interesting process because I, there would be times when I would want to loop it in a certain way to make my music sound interesting, and there were times when she wanted to make her dance look interesting, which might make my music not sound so interesting. The debate between us, we actually had to compose this together. It was the most collaborative piece that we ever made because we had to sit there and debate every little thing that we were doing that we wanted. So that was for, for us really interesting that it could not have been made separately because every choice influenced both the movement and the music. Yeah? So here's the result of that process. You're seeing three of the six cameras that we recorded it with. We recorded it with six views because we needed it to be visible no matter where they were. What you're seeing at the bottom was some information that was telling you about what's going on. The first number is the loop number. The second number is the step, the repetition within that loop. Then the, 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 S, the S greater than greater than means it's a shifting loop like you saw before. And D with nothing means the duration is fixed, right? So it's, it's the same duration. So you see that, you know, we're already, we've been here, I've been talking for 22 seconds, I'm sure they haven't even gotten off the floor yet because we're repeating this material, right? back down a little bit. I think at 26, we're gonna, no, there. Now we're in loop two. It's um, 
uh, this, the, it's not shifting in time, but the duration is getting shorter. Now we're in loop three. It's shifting and the duration is fixed. And now it's not shifting and the duration is getting longer. Okay, so okay, so you get the idea. So in the end, that five minutes through the repetition turned into a video that was 45 minutes long and had 3,000 edits in it. But this video was never shown to the public. This was given to the dancers and we said, you have to learn this exactly as you see it and perform it perfectly. And that was the piece. The instruction was that they had to replicate this absolutely inhuman movement. And three dancers quit because um, they felt it was so inhuman that it was making them anxious and depressed. It was, it was absolutely not, it, it didn't feel, it, it was enough that they said we cannot continue with this. And, and it was interesting, that was actually also part of the interesting breakthroughs because every dancer had a different way to try and memorize this. You can only imagine what it takes to memorize 3,000 edits like this, yeah? Every dancer had a different method, but when those quit, people quit and we had to hire three new dancers, when those dancers had to train the new dancers about how to do this, because the other ones had been, been with us for the whole process up until then, um, that act of teaching is what allowed them to understand how to do it well and in the end they did learn it amazingly they really learned it and so um, here's what it looked like when it ended up on this on the stage uh, will this go without me or will I have to hit a button here I hit a button oh shoot So the music, the video you see on the screen, which is a different video, and the lighting information all have been looped digitally. So they're perfect. The dancers are attempting to match that digital perfection with their bodies. This moment, that blackout is the first time it's not one of these palindrome loops. There's an actual edit with it, you know? And that gap, they have enough time to get back into position, but it, over the next 25 minutes, that black space gets shorter and shorter and shorter until they can't actually get back to where they were because it's like the pressure from the machine is increasing during the entire piece, over the entire hour of the piece. should be like a lot louder. It's deafening, it's deafening, and it's deafening when it's in the piece.
this moment here in the center, you know when you walk in the street and you meet someone, you don't know which way to go? That was choreographed into the thing and then they had to loop that. Just want to get to one last little bit here I want to show you. This moment is 25 minutes into the piece. And they come and they just, uh, they are trying to extend their arm and they really address the audience. They look right into their eyes. It was crazy because I would watch the audience as we were doing this and I would start to see some of them doing this along with them. I mean, honestly, it, it really would happen. And this moment came and they would look at the audience and they would extend their hands. It's almost like they're asking for help. And I swear to God, it was like the audience breathed for the first time in 25 minutes. It was, it was really something. So first of all, you know, those six dancers, including Dawn, who was one of them, uh, deserve so much credit for doing an absolutely inhuman thing. The way that they learned it and the perfection with which they did it, because the piece didn't get good until they could almost do it. But of course, they could never do it. That was the point. They could never do it. They were in a constant state of failure, trying to appropriate the state of the machine. And that, that was like, um, yeah, that's the piece that I can die happy. It was a, for us, it was a really big success in that way. But something really different happened, you know, because some people were disappointed because they were coming to see a Troika Ranch piece. They were expecting all kinds of sensors and interactive media, and there was no interactivity at all in this. It was completely fixed, right? And, but we had really done something different, and I also want to give that a name. You saw it already because my patch is wrong. Will it go on? Is the digital intervention. Here, we took something that was from the very nature of digital technology, which is this idea of looping, right? It's core to what technology does. And we impose that on the artistic process. And I promise you, if you go watch the video of Loop Diver, which by the way, all of our work that we ever did, the, whole, the full length pieces are on our website. Um, if you look at this piece and you look back at any other thing that Don choreographed, they look nothing alike. In other words, we made, for us anyhow, a new kind of movement because we allowed the computer itself to intervene on our process. We took on a, that idea. This one you might diagram this way. At the top is the system. We said, we're going to use this looping tool and we're going to make our dancers perform exactly what they see. Right? That's the system, and we will not ever give in to that. There was one dancer in the group. She's such a fantastic performer. She's the kind of dancer that whenever she performs, your eyes just go boom, because she's so great at, at attracting your attention. And in this piece, she would start to try and get out of the loop so she could do the kinds of things that made your eye go to her. And we really had to stop her and say, in this piece, you can't do that. You have to be true to the system only. And that means it's an ensemble piece where you don't get to be featured in that way because you're such an incredible performer, which she totally did when we said that. So the system is paramount. In the middle are the creators, and we're fighting against the system. Um, it's useful at this point to tell a very quick story. I was, in, I was studying with Morton Sabotnik, my teacher, as I mentioned before, at California Institute of the Arts. There were 12 of us in this graduate seminar. We had known each other for two years already because we'd been to school together, so we knew each other's music pretty well. So he gave us this experiment. He gave us the first two pages of Pierre Boulez's Piano Sonata No. 2, a super abstract atonal piece. I don't know if you know it, but anyway, it's, it's, it's pretty out there. And we were to take it home, and his instruction was you can change two things. You can redo the dynamics completely, like you can change all the volume of, you know, pianissimo or forte or whatever. You can do anything you want with that. 
and you can change the octave transposition, meaning if it was an A, it still had to be an A, but you could go up two octaves or go down one octave or whatever. That was all that you could change. He said, now go home and you do that. And so we did that for, and we returned next week with our written out music. He brought in this amazing piano player we had there who could sight read anything, a guy called Gaylord Mowry. And he sat at the piano and he took our scores and he shuffled them like a deck of cards and he handed the scores to the piano player. And he started to play them. And after each piece, we had to guess whose piece it was and we, we were all 100% right in every case. We all exactly got it right because even though he only gave us two parameters to change, the human ego is so strong that it will always find a way to express itself. It, you know, and that's what's happening in this moment for Don and I. We still are Don and Mark. We are still interested in the things we're interested in. We impose some limits on ourselves, some extreme limits, but we're struggling every moment to get out of it. So it's still our piece, but that struggle is really interesting. And, uh, and the dancers too, you know, I talked about this, um, this performer. You know, actually, as Don always points out when we talk about this, to go from here to here in zero time, which is what an edit asks you to do, you can't do it. A videotape can do that, or a video, whatever, but you as a human being always have to do the intermediary movement. There's all this travel here, right? So we asked the dancers to do something impossible, and every edit that they had to do was an impossible thing for them to accomplish, and how they dealt with that impossibility, that became their creative expression, right? And so dealing with all this, uh, the system of the creators and, and at the bottom comes out the performers, as I said, where they're dealing with the system and how they're going to perform in this and let their ego and their personality come through. So here we are. We've got this digital reflection, a lot of work, which you still see today. There's plenty of work that still has interactivity where it's coming from the body, where it's following this way. And then you've got this thing that we did, this thing, this idea of the digital intervention, which for Don and I, it was like this super exciting, massive development because something changed entirely. And I, I, you know, so, but yet I still love this stuff. I spent most of my life, not only did I make this artwork, I made a whole software just to be able to do that kind of work. I mean, I didn't even talk about that, but for those of you who don't know, along the way to make the work I was making, I created the software Isadora, which is the workshop I'm teaching tomorrow. So, what do we do? Because I don't want to give up on this, but this seems far more artistically powerful than, than that. I suggest that we do this. We crash them into each other. And if you do, I think that you get this. So, those are thousands and thousands and thousands of starlings in the southwest of England. And it may not look like it, but there's a totally a system going on here which scientists have studied. I want to tell you what the system is in, in a brief, simple version. There's two parameters the birds are paying attention to, proximity and velocity. It's interesting, that's like the two parameters I was just talking about. And they have three rules that they're following. Don't get too close to your neighbor. Don't get too far away. And then do your best, and this is the critical part, to adopt the speed and velocity of the entire flock. Not your neighbors, but the entire group, right? They're really trying to sense where the whole group is going. But they're not machines. They're not computers. They make mistakes, right? And so the error in implementing those rules, their inability to sense exactly where the entire flock is going or a bit of wind comes into the system and throws them off a little bit, that's where the source, that's where the system's complexity comes from. And the most important part, the input to the system is also the output to the system. Remember I talked about the feedback that didn't exist? Well, here, the flock is the output. We're all watching it. I mean, I, there's, by the way, there's a, there's a building in Berlin. It's not as many as this. It's a building in Berlin that every October, there's just all the birds hang out there and they do this. And I just could watch it for hours. It's so beautiful somehow. There's organization, yet it's ever evolving. There's something really fantastic about it. 
But the flock is the thing we see. We don't really see each individual little bird. I guess you could put your eye on one and try to follow it, but you see the flock. You see the aggregate. But that thing that is the output is what I told you is the input. That's what makes it happen. So the feedback loop here is absolutely locked in, right? And that is interesting to me that, that the output is the score, if you will, let's call it a score, for, for how they're supposed to move, yeah? So what if we did this with computers? What if we did this with one of our systems that we're interested in doing? You have sensors over here, and they're sensing the movement of a body, let's say. That goes to a computer. You have some rules in which you're interpreting that information. Right? And then that goes out to control the media. But instead of it being a video, instead of it being a sound, what if the media you're controlling is the body itself? What if you are giving direct instructions to the body about how to move so that it makes the sensors, when you give that instruction, that means the sensors pick it up, it goes back into the computer, it goes through the rules, and it makes the body move again. So in other words, can we adopt this very same system, this kind of idea of flocking where the input is going into, the output is the input, and put it into the works that we're doing, yeah? That's like what we stumbled upon in Loop Diver, but we didn't have the loop because we just fixed it and they learned it. What I'm doing on um, Sunday night is an attempt at this, yeah? It's a simple attempt at doing this idea. But when, since we got here, I'm, this is my last bit here now, I want to point out something about what we see here. It's a self-organizing system. It doesn't start with any knowledge, right? You've got the rules there. That's kind of, I suppose, a knowledge. But the rules are just there to filter out what's going through the system. There's no inherent knowledge in the system. The knowledge evolves by doing it, which is what's going to happen on Sunday when I meet these two dancers for the very first time and train them how to do this piece, because we've never tried it before, right? Simple rules yield very complex results because even though the rules are simple, because there are human beings involved, because we make mistakes, because we're imperfect in the way we do it, there's always new information going into the system. And if those mistakes are amplified and become part of the performance, then there's complexity is automatically going to happen. Feedback drives the evolution of the system. It's only through having this loop going from all through itself that the evolution of the system comes, that the dancers will start to like learn how that feels, learn what happens if they do certain things, and then react to that and start to, again, try to inject their personality into it. And there's the final thing is agency. But in this case, both the computer and the performer energize the system. The performers energize it by moving their bodies, but the computer energizes it by the way it filters through that data and presents new information to them. Yeah? So if you remember back to NIM, those are the same properties that I had when I made my, my learning game in 1974. So I guess it took me a really long time to realize that everything I needed to know about this, I actually knew already 35 years ago or whenever that was. So I think that the biggest thing to think about is if you're going to work with interactivity, thinking about getting the information to truly change the way the performers are changing could lead you to a new kind of music, a new kind of dance, a new kind of whatever, because you're going to make choices that you would never make because the computer is going to force you to make them. So that is the end. Thank you. So, and I'm happy if you have a question or anything, any questions, I'm happy to take them. Well, I mean, you know, the, the notion of newness, I think to say a movement I've never seen before, it's, yeah, I mean, I guess it's possible, yeah. but I think that notion has to do with context. And you know, I, it's, I didn't point it out in the talk, but um, 
this idea of the intervention is not a new idea. It's, it's certainly not our invention to do it. Arnold Schoenberg did it with the 12-tone system. Uh, Trisha Brown did it with a system that she had called Locus, where she had a, she had a cube, imaginary cube in space, and all 26 letters of the alphabet were assigned to different parts of the cube, and she would write out sentences, and she would have to try and dance it. So, you know, this idea of intervening in yourself in this way is not new. What I feel like we added to it was, we said, we're going to take those out of the world of technology. Because think about it, one offer that I've made every time I've given this talk, which no one has taken me up on, so now's your chance, is I would like to see a dance piece that, uh, where the choreography is defined by the user interface of Facebook. <laughs> because actually Facebook is designed to make your eyes and your hand with the mouse or trackpad or your finger on the tablet move in certain ways. They choreograph you. Every time you sit down with that or any other thing like that, they choreograph your body, right? They're controlling you in that way. I mean, there's lots of other ways they're controlling us too, but I'm just talking about from a movement perspective, yeah? So to me, that's an idea that I would be interested in. How do you take something that is so germane to the notion of technology that it's going to tell you something new about, about how we interact with technology. I was saying to Clara, yeah, um, the piece that one of the pieces I'm working on right now has no media in it whatsoever. It's just me talking, uh, doing this improvised uh, stream of consciousness speech and a dancer dancing. And, um, but it came, it, even though it's not a media piece, we were just looking at how people's relationship to each other is changing in the time, especially the last few years, the notion of trolls and how you can attack and say really terrible, horrible things about someone because you're anonymous and you have the protection of, of being of anonymity. And um, we felt it was important to make a piece because the audience is on stage with us in the piece. We want to be like this far away from them, looking in their eyes, because that kind of presence is something that technology is taking or uh, is, makes it easy to not have or to avoid even. And so even though it's not obviously a media piece, it is inspired by our relationship to media. Um, so anyway, I, I don't know if I'm seeing a movement I've never seen before, but part of it is, is that I, I certainly, we moved, the dancers moved in, in, in that piece in a way that Dawn had never envisioned them to move. And I'll, I'll show you, I, I shared this with, um, did you put it online? I didn't, it was fine with me actually. I didn't know if I really said. Um, I'll just brief if I can find it. Oh no, maybe I had to name it. Yeah, here's just a small, here's a small part. This is from that Shemitah thing I was telling you about, Clara. So this is, um, oh wait, you can't see it over there. So here's a tiny bit of these two dancers watching, they're, what they're seeing is, they're seeing an image of themselves. The audience doesn't see any video, the video is behind the audience, and they're trying, it's doing all kinds of stuff to the image of them, and they're trying to follow it. That's kind of at the beginning when it's sort of simple, but here by the, these videos are not great, I'm sorry to say, because the camera's all moving around and stuff, but. All right, so while there's maybe not a movement I've never seen before, the, the combination of seeing it over a long pace, a space of time and also what I find interesting, the way they focus, like you feel them, the concentration level is so high, there's something special about that. And, and so I can't say it's a movement I've never seen before necessarily, but it's a movement that I found interesting. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, well, no, I mean, well, I mean, I didn't really start with the media stuff until CalArts. This guy, Morton Sabotnik, um, he's one of the recognized pioneers of electronic music in America. And he's having a big, if, by the way, if you happen to be in Berlin on November 17th, 
the album that made him famous is called Silver Apples of the Moon, and they're doing a 50th anniversary performance of it in Berlin on November 17th, because it's 50 years now since they released it. Anyway, I was interested in writing music, and um, I was very, I was already, I was programming computers, that was my day job. And I went to school, and he took those two things and he put them together. So it wasn't until Cal Arts that I started getting really interested in interactivity. And it was basically because he did a piece, at the time there was a sensor that doesn't exist anymore called the air drum. It looked like a, a clave, so it was about that big around and about that long. And it could sense up, down, uh, down, up, left, right, twist right, and twist left. And each of those would produce a different MIDI note. And so the guy made it because people were going to like play drum sets in, in the air with no drums, right? Which I saw some people do. But Mort used this to make a conducting system so that he could have a conductor not only conduct a, a real 14-piece chamber orchestra, but the MIDI sequencer as well, and it was sensing all this movement. And I saw him do it and I said, God, we should make that for a dancer. And that's where it really began. So that was, 19, that was 1987 when I saw that. And pretty much I was, once that happened, I was on the road, um, going down that road ever since. Well, I think, you know, I think that in those early days, there was so, I mean, it was all so new that people were just like, you know, I mean, there were so many crashes also. I mean, it was just, everything was crashing left and right. And this kind of gave the whole field a bad name, really, because stuff was crashing so often. Because we were trying stuff and we were like, we were, we were making it all ourselves. Remember, that's the other big difference is you guys can actually, like I brought with me, I didn't know if I would use it, but this is a fantastic little sensor called the Leap Motion. It measures the movement of your hands, yeah? This is like 100 bucks or something, 80 euros or I don't know what. You can buy this. When we were doing this, I mean, again, it's not anything I'm necessarily proud of. I'm just saying it just didn't exist. We had to make it all. So there were lots of problems and crashes, and people were like, kind of wrote, started to write it off. That was one reason, because so many performances failed. We really prided ourselves on making sure that we did not have crashes like that in Troika Ranch performances. But I guess there was a lot of interest in the technology, but we were always like, the technology is interesting for five seconds. And, and I think that... Um, you know, our, as, I mean, at first we were really interested in the technology too, and we thought it was cool, and that's part of why we wanted to do it, but as we grew as artists, I would say that we decided, actually, it's, it doesn't matter for the audience. It's sort of like a jazz performance. If you go to a jazz performance, and you don't know that they're improvising, the music is still good if they're good musicians, right? But if you go to a jazz performance and you know that they're making it up in front of you that second, that adds a level of intensity to, the, to it that we can love, right? In a similar way, the audiences, I mean, who saw a Troika Ranch piece twice? Not that many people, right? They came once, they saw it, whatever. So in that sense, the piece just had to be good. If it wasn't good, it wasn't good. I mean, you know, the technology wasn't going to make it better. What made it better was this moment where Dawn went, and that night she wanted to wait there for five seconds because she felt a relationship to the audience, and she knew that holding it for five seconds was going to make it more dramatic, or she wanted to go <clears throat> and immediately jump one second later because that felt right. Giving those opportunities to the performers, I still think that's meaningful. And I think that, and by the way, I'm, I'm not against technology, I mean, I'm not against the whole sensory thing in general. It's another topic which, I mean, I could talk for days about all this stuff, but, but I think that one of the problems is that most of the sensors are actually not very sensitive. Um, if you look at a violin, I always use the violin as a model of the perfect instrument because it is so sensitive to human gesture that if you just take the bow and go like this and just vibrate your, your finger a little bit, a really talented violin player, just that with one note can make you cry because they control it so beautifully and because it responds so intimately to their movement. There are, I would say there are no digital instruments that do that because, because the reason is 
try name name for me one digital instrument that someone would spend 25 years learning how to play. None. And the reason why is because it doesn't reward practice. At a certain point, after three months maybe, with the leap motion sensor, I've gotten as good as I'm going to get with it. It doesn't reward practice in that way. And I think that has to do with making them more sensitive and, you know, I think that's actually possible. And there may be instruments that will come, but up until now, 16 bits or 24 bits or whatever, it's not enough, right? So anyway, to answer your question, I think that definitely people were drawn to see our work early on because the technology. There were lots of practitioners like us, in, especially in Europe. And of course, people were curious. It was all really new. And of course, we also promoted ourselves that way because back in those days, all you had to do was say the word computer and performance or whatever, and you got an article in the newspaper. I mean, that, it worked. I mean, it just worked. And, um, but in the end, uh, I think people were coming to see our pieces because, because of what we had to say inside of them. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know, but I mean, there's always, I mean, there's also universals. It's like we had plenty of people like walk out of Loop Diver. I had everything from people walking out of Loop Diver to when we performed it in Moscow, this really well-known choreographer told me it was a masterpiece. I don't know. I don't know. I can't tell you which it is for you, but um, I think that just depends on lots of diff different factors. All right, let's call it a day. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate your time. Yeah.